please welcome Lila Ibrahim, Chief Operating Officer, DeepMind. Eva Maidel, Member of the European Parliament. And ITRE rapporteur on the AI Act. And Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you again. You're going to be seeing a lot of me these two days. Um, you're all here because you're interested in AI, presumably, so I'm going to start with a public service announcement. As of this morning, there is a new landing page on Bloomberg.com that will give you everything you need every day on the subject of artificial intelligence. It is Bloomberg.com forward slash technology forward slash AI. Very important to put that technology before the AI as you'll find out if you try to go to Bloomberg.com slash AI, but don't go there um, for the time being. We knew when we began planning this event months ago, Lila and Eva, that AI had to be part of our program, obviously. What we didn't know, of course, was that OpenAI's ChatGBT was going to take the world by storm. And for most people, AI was just an abstraction Ah, they knew that it powered Google Search and Alexa, but that was sort of about it, right? Just to get a sense of where we're at, I want a show of hands from the audience. How many of you right here, right now, have either tried, have tried either ChatGBT or Google's Bard? Put up your hands. Not bad, huh? I'm not going to ask those of you who haven't tried it to put up your hands. Um, and who here has started working with either of those as a productivity tool, incorporating them into your own workflow or those of your employees? Show of hands, please. Also, impressive. Ladies, I want the audience to understand the story behind your views on artificial intelligence because neither of you began life at least as an adult, right, as a data scientist. You're an engineer, Lyle. Yes. And you studied business. Tell us a bit about how you got here, Eva. <laughs> well, lately, the European Parliament and the European institutions are all about various acts and, uh, you know, uh, regulatory um, enforcements and so on. So that's why I guess I am here in a way because we've been viewed from everyone across the world as the place of regulation. Not so much of innovation, I have to be uh, brutally honest uh, though, but as um, we are approaching the final days of um, the uh, work on the AI Act, um, I have to say that I'm very happy to be working uh, on it because uh, it's my second term as a member of the European Parliament and I have worked on all the big uh, tech files that we have had and always tried to balance between uh, enabling companies uh, to develop in Europe but also in the same time trying to put some sort of a uh, regulatory environment that could uh, protect uh, citizens or give more predictability for businesses or make Europe more attractive for businesses because I'm also one of the rapporteurs of the CHIPS Act, the European CHIPS Act, which uh, negotiations concluded yesterday afternoon uh, in the European Parliament. And I see the CHIPS Act, for example, uh, as a legislation that is a little bit more strategic compared to previous legislations like the DSA, the DMA, many of you have heard of those um, that have a pure regulatory focus. Lila, you spent a good part of your career in the semiconductor industry, you've been in software, you've been in venture capital. Why AI? Yeah, that's an excellent <laughs> question. Um, I was 30 years, now I'm, in, I'm 30 years into my career right now, and I feel extraordinarily fortunate to have spent earlier parts of my career bringing new technologies into new markets and to new segments. Um, and, and I, as you said, I've had a pretty circuitous career. And I, I decided after some period of time, like I, I'm like, I kind of need a break. And someone said, um, you really need to talk to this company. 
And I said, oh, yeah, not, not quite yet. And they're like, no, it's, it's based in London. I'm like, oh, def I'm in California. And it was wintertime. I'm like, yeah, definitely not. Uh, but I was, um, and they're like, oh, they're working in AI. And I said, well, I don't know. I know a lot about technology and, and new markets. But I, I did it as a favor to a mentor, and it turned out to be a life-changing conversation. But I was kept trying to get out of the job. And I thought, if I want to do AI, I can stay in Silicon Valley. Um, why would I want to work on AI if I've not done this before? And so I was asking a lot of questions during the interview process. In fact, I spent 50 hours interviewing the company to make sure this was the field I wanted to go into in the last part of my career. This was the role as chief operating officer, and this was the company. And what really happened was I realized that AI was the intersection of technology and social impact, and this was an organization with high integrity. And the more I interviewed the company to, to see if this is really what I wanted to do, I'd go home and I'd tuck my twin daughters into bed saying, what kind of world are they going to live in? And can I bring my experience of technology and social impact to make DeepMind's approach better, faster? Because the organization that's going to develop a more generalized AI first should be the one who I feel like from an integrity perspective can do it. And I, I often describe it as a moral calling. Mm. Um, and that is how I ended up at DeepMind and being the person on the executive staff who brought in a different perspective. Now that we know a little bit about the mindsets with which you approach this subject, I want to hammer away at both of you and cover a lot of ground over the course of this panel. Um, there is an extraordinary amount of attention around AI and specifically generative AI technology that underlying ChatGBT, BARD and others like Stable Diffusion. Help us level set, it's important. Is the exuberance justified and what about the fears? Lila. I think it's a very exciting time in AI. Generative AI um, is something that I think has really shifted the conversation because it's I just, as we saw by the show of hands here, it's made everyone's interactions with AI slightly differently. We've been fortunate to have been working on this for a while, so um, are aware of the cap capabilities and potential. Um, the area that I'm particularly excited about actually has less to do with generative AI and really about where AI can help advance science and benefit humanity um, in some of the most challenging problems of our time, such as the environment and climate crisis. We're already using um, AI systems to do things like make existing infrastructure, uh, optimize existing infrastructure. So we've worked with our counterparts at Google to optimize data centers and saving up to 30, 40% of energy savings. We've been able to use AI as a tool to develop better prediction models. Uh, the Met Office in the UK, actually, um, out of 50, uh, we had 50 met, uh, met meteorologists actually wanting to use the DeepMind AI system for the prediction, and this could be critical in times of extreme climate um, shifts. And then finally, we're using advanced AI systems to uncover new solutions to problems that we don't fully understand or that we think may never be achievable. We've worked to uh, and use AI to help control the plasma of nuclear fusion reactors, which is an important step in the safety of making this a viable solution. So I think there's a lot of things that we're seeing, and, and, and generative AI in my mind is really just the first rung on a very long ladder. I think it's exciting to think about the potential, and again, the reason I joined DeepMind was thinking about what future I want to hand my children and the generations that follow. And I believe AI can help us create a better society. Eva, you're, you have a constructive view on the role of business and technology in the economy and in society. So how do you balance the two, particularly as someone who is drafting regulation, the exuberance on the one side, and as I said, the fear on the other? Um, well, it's a fine balance, and it's a very difficult balance. Uh, first and foremost, because um, the European uh, law on AI was presented by the Commission um, more than a year ago. Mm -hmm. So the work just in the European Parliament has been ongoing be before the whole hype around ChatGPT. 
Um, and it has not taken into consideration those foundational models. So right now, we've already had a difficult discussion into making sure how we legislate, not just from a civil liberties perspective, not just from the perspective of privacy and protection of our citizens, but also with the per, per, you know, perception of helping companies, particularly in Europe, innovate, grow, flourish, and develop some of those tools that would help society become better. Over the past couple of months, the conversation has shifted, uh, meaning we would need to address those foundational models as well. So there's a number of things of how to make that balance right. And I don't think it's just up to the new legislation. First and foremost, we need to look already at existing laws such as GDPR and others and see where regulatory bodies are enforcing them well, whether they're implementing the law at all and where um, they are acting at the time and create a coordination among them. So the same set of rules applies all across uh, countries and jurisdictions which uh, abide by those uh, rules. The second thing is to make sure that this um, you know, uh, horizontal law that we are working in, it will affect all uh, fields uh, in society um, is done wisely. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion around what uh, consists of high-risk AI uh, to make sure we very well uh, discuss and label what is low-risk AI, what should be banned, what is high-risk AI, and how those are decided. Because depending on, on which category a company falls into, you're going to abide by more rules or less rules. Um, and finally, I think it's, it's, so it's complementing this too, and finally it's about political leaders uh, trying to understand uh, this disruption that's happening in society and how it will change society. So in that context, I have to ask you both about the letter. And the letter I'm talking about is the one that was signed about three weeks ago by more than 1,100 technologists and industry leaders in AI calling for a six-month pause on development to allow for more safety controls. And, of course, it caused a stir. I suspect many of you are familiar with it. It described, and I'm going to quote directly from the letter, an out-of-control race to develop and de deploy ever more powerful digital minds that no one, not even their creators, can understand, predict, or reliably control. Is that an accurate description of what's going on? Um, I think Lila can tell better <laughs> if that's an accurate description, but um, from uh, where I'm sitting, the way I see things is that this letter and the various calls that we have heard and read over the past couple of weeks in particular have to trigger the conversation, the societal conversation. Uh, and in that societal conversation, policy makers, political leaders, the business that works, many of the people that represent different stakeholders and parts of society who've signed that letter have to be part of, of that conversation because Ultimately, and I have said that in the past, if you want society to embrace technology and to trust technology, you need to have that social contract with society. And if it's necessary to put more guardrails, to put um, certain uh, mechanisms and principles in place, and this is what we want to do in the AI Act, you need some sort of uh, clear principles and mechanisms, not just to regulate the next big thing that is coming, that, but that will be foundational for the technology under which whatever you want to create that has to do something with AI, you need to abide by those basic principles and, and mechanisms. Um, so if we do that, it would be very helpful for whoever wants to work on AI to know that these are the safety things you need to take care of. Um, and I think if more rules are necessary, uh, which 
the letter calls, they need to be discussed. It will not help to ban it in one country or another country because it will still be developing and operational um, in, a, in a third country or a fourth country or a nation or a continent. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's a very complex conversation and my worry is that it's not necessarily taking place in the way I just described. So, Lila, is your industry out of control? Well, I'm, I don't quite see it that way. Um, I do think the essence of the letter which calls for responsibility and safety is, up, is a good one and one that we agree with at DeepMind. I also, with what you've just said about the importance of having, how do we bring p parties together across sectors, across geographic boundaries. Within DeepMind, um, as I said, I've spent the past five years really you know, you can have a set of AI principles to put them into practice and do it in a way where it's part of the DNA of an organization. It's, it's hard work. It takes effort and it takes leadership time and commitment and dedication and accountability to do that. And you can't have conversations externally without having this inside your own organization. And so, um, you know, even since DeepMind's founding, we've had a set of AI principles since 2010. Uh, which really became the cornerstone of, I think, what a lot of other companies are doing. So I feel that the responsibility needs to start with conversations in the organization. It needs to be operationalized. It needs to be touching all aspects of the development. Then you can think about the deployment, like responsible development deployment. And I think what's happening is a lot of times we think about the deployment and then responsibility becomes like a bolt-on rather than truly integrated. And then we need to be able to have the communication and the conversations. What I'm excited about right now um, that's happening in our industry is that, again, show of hands, that we can have these conversations. More people are interested in coming, have the seat around the table. Different stakeholders are from private sector, uh, from companies outside the AI sector, from government, from civil society. And I think it's part of the reason that we're here today is because we want to raise the visibility of these conversations and the need for us all to be working together. What about this idea of a pause on development? The arguments in favor are safety, of course, job security for people whose livelihoods may be threatened, and, you know, at the end of the day, even the viability of the human race. And the arguments against are non-compliance, right? Nobody's gonna honor an agreement like that. Enforcement is basically impossible. And by way of example, the ge geographical you know, point that you raised, China and Russia just don't care. They're gonna speed ahead while the West stands still, and so we can't afford to stop. Where do you stand? Well Maybe just a question it might sound a little bit too political, but um, a lot of the people calling for a stop of the development are continuing mm. to go ahead with that development. So if they might, truly... might you be thinking about Elon Musk? <laughs> for example, um, but not only, uh, probably. Um, so I, I just think that... Um, you think it's hypocritical? You, so No, I, I just think that... You know, one way to put a ban is from a regulatory perspective to say we will put a ban. But again, you won't put a ban everywhere, right? So it would still continue to develop. And another thing is for companies to sit together, because we are speaking about a handful of companies at the moment, at least the, you know, the, 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 the ones that are creating the hype, to decide to maybe slow down and take a step back. The, from the point of view where I see things and uh, what politicians um, can do is um, have the conversation with society. Do we really need this at the speed it is developing now? These are some, this is one question that we, why would we want this developing in this particular way? What are the perils? What are the possibilities? Um, you know, the speed is, is unprecedented. Um, and uh, it's very difficult for society to be able to, to grasp the speed with which things are moving. Um, we earlier in, in the breakout uh, session talked a little bit about jobs. I've been hearing that jobs will be lost for about 10 years now. 
I'm not necessarily seeing it. And I think the conversation now has shifted to other societal concerns that are much broader and are much bigger. And we need to be able to assess those. It's even a philosophical discussion and it's a very hard discussion and this is why I think from a political perspective it's not easy to have it and it might not happen until a more major, one could call it a catastrophic event, doesn't happen to trigger that conversation. But ideally it should happen earlier. Lila, has the Pandora's box that Sam Altman opened by releasing chat GBT to the public, change life inside DeepMind. Is there now an inexorable tug toward uh, allocating resources for um, you know, large language models and generative AI in a way that wasn't before? DeepMind's been in existence since 2010. It's a long time. Uh, we've been working on generative AI models for several years, in fact, even uh, a few years ago when we released our first technical paper, we held off on releasing the technical paper until we had done an ethics assessment and realizing that there were, wasn't even a taxonomy about how to talk about risk. Um, so we held back a technical paper until we did this together. So I would say generative AI is part of DeepMind's portfolio, but it's not the only thing. Um, our mission is really to advance science to benefit humanity. And we've been working, you know, it's more of a long-term mission. It's why things like uh, alpha fold on protein folding or the work around climate are areas where we're investing. So we have a slightly different approach to a lot of this. Has it shifted how we operate? I would say the conversation, like, all, you know, we've been very internally focused. It's shifted the conversation now. Everybody wants to understand a little bit more about AI, understand, uh, you know, Implica potential implications, near-term, long-term, bias, inclusion, uh, implications on uh, labor market, et cetera. So I think what's exciting is like for us to be able to say, okay, well, we come with this knowledge expert, we come as knowledge experts on AI, but there's so much we don't even know. Even when we were developing our alpha fold system, we brought in biologists because we said, okay, we know what AI can do to solve this uh, 50-year-old problem in biology about understanding life and disease and all these other things, but what implications does this have on the biology community? So what's happened now is we've shifted of being internally focused to say, okay, we can bring this, we can share our knowledge, but regulators, please, how can we help you understand this? Where do we, where is best, how is it best to regulate? The creative community. What, like, let's explain a little bit more about what generative AI is and isn't. Tell us a little bit more about how you might be able to use this. What are you worried about? So we can build that into how we do our research. People know, though, that at the very least, they're aware that DeepMind is part of Google. And they wonder, and I wonder, whether because of the phenomenon that generative AI has become in only a matter of weeks, really, you know, whether Sundar, the CEO, or Ruth, the CFO, is saying, you folks at DeepMind, I need you to... <laughs> I need you to be working on this now. Um, DeepMind has operated as um, an autonomous organization. We uh, joined forces with Google in 2014. And the founders made the decision at that time that in order to accelerate progress towards the, the mission of advancing science to benefit humanity, it really required additional resources and a commitment to the long term versus the short term quarter. And that was something that that was very well aligned with Google. And I would say we've had um, amazing support from Alphabet and collaborate a lot with our counterparts across the organization. Having spent the first 18 years of my career inside of Intel um, and inside of a corporate environment, I'm very under, you know, I understand a corporate environment and I would say that it's a, it's a healthy relationship. And I actually think that you look at, two, you know, it's two of the world's leading labs in AI um, that have really gotten enabled some of the technology to get to where it's at and trying to approach this next stage of how can we continue to be bold while also being responsible. Eva, you, you referred earlier not so obliquely to Elon Musk. Um, and as you're probably aware, he confirmed in an interview a couple of days ago that he plans to create what he calls a third option, which is to say a third option to Microsoft slash OpenAI and Google in artificial intelligence. 
You know, given what he's accomplished in other industries, obviously the automotive industry, space travel, satellite communications, should we welcome a third option in the form of Elon? Is that a, like, is it a good thing that he's out there buying up NVIDIA chips and trying to poach talent from companies like DeepMind? To, mm -hmm. So there's more competition. Well, as we have seen, it takes quite a while to develop those models and it needs different, you need different things. You just don't need a great idea. Um, um, I think, um, you know, um, would there be a third, fourth, fifth and sixth option? It's to be seen. There are European AI companies working on that at the moment uh, as well. So um, competition is, of course, uh, a good thing. Healthy competition is necessary and I think what is important from here onwards is also for regulators to see how rules are enforced, uh, but also whether those rules have to be better adapted uh, to uh, the digital and technological era we are living in uh, when we speak about data, for example, and the way companies are being acquired or merged and so on and so forth. Um, so um, I think uh, our role is to make sure that those rules are um, you know, there and we implement uh, them and we create uh, the right market conditions, speaking for Europe, of course. Um, but uh, on the other hand, um, you know, for us, we need to see how this thing will develop in the long run. It's not just about seeing the forest, it's also about seeing the trees. Uh, it's something that uh, we need to tackle some things today, but there are a number of things in the long run need to be tackled. And what I want is that we do not see this things in the next five, seven, ten years from now and the implications on the way democracy works, on the way our education system works, uh, on uh, um, you know, um, the, the, the way we take decisions as policy makers. So I think um, we need to understand that it's not business as usual for policy makers and it's not just by creating one law that you're going to solve it all. It's a much more complex environment and we to take a different set of skills, a different approach to policy making and decision uh, taking, um, and overall a different type of leadership, I would say, from can the I, public sector. Can I maybe add something Please. onto that, um, building off of your point? So I've spent the majority of my career in Silicon Valley, and it's really interesting to think about the differences of having uh, building an organization that's headquartered in the in tech capital, Silicon Valley, versus building it in with more of a European-centric view, which I think, you know, London and uh, the, the diversity of ethnicities and uh, skill sets that we're able to bring, not just computer scientists, but neuroscientists, social scientists, anthropologists, et cetera, around the table into the organization. I feel, after 30 years in tech, like building an organization here is quite different. The history, the culture, the multinational perspective, the way that you approach conversations like how might this impact the job market, not just jobs being tech sector, but more broadly, how does it impact the arts? How does it impact you know, the neighboring countries? It's a very different approach. And I think that actually you talked about in another way. I think actually this is quite exceptional. And so I would, you know, organizations that are headquartered here, which I would expect much of the audience is like, there is a, an advantage and a way, a different path that I think everyone is, is charting out. And I think that's quite exciting. And sometimes we kind of lose that perspective of really the values that we can bring into the work that we do every day that impacts the rest of the world. Lila, I love a note of optimism, and I think given that we're here in Ireland and this is the Bloomberg New Economy Gateway Europe, that is a very appropriate place on which to end our conversation. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Ava Medell and Lila Ibrahim. <laughs>